Hey Robert, uh, we all heard your uh, <coughs> your speech uh, from just now. Um, can you share some uh, some insight in, in in our personal future? What will your future look like uh, in in 20 years from now? What will my future uh, look like in, in 20 years from now? And what are dramatic changes in our personal lives? If we're talking about how technology will impact our personal lives, then there's a few things happening. One is the rate of advances in automation, robotics and artificial intelligence is going to be such that it would eliminate an awful lot of jobs. So we're going to have to retrain on a continuous basis to ensure we can feed ourselves and our families. So I think what we'll see is that we'll be learning a lot more. We'll actually, if we want to be a kind of vibrant player in our world, we'll be learning and relearning. If you leave school today at the age of 18, there's a very good chance you could have 20 or 30 different jobs by the time you retire at 100, because uh, our life expectancy is also going up dramatically. The second is our technology is moving. So we used to have desktops, and we had portables, and we had mobiles and smartphones. We're now talking about a lot of wearable devices that do everything. It will be embedded. So it's very likely that 20 years from now, it'll either be embedded or grown into our bodies, the technology that we use and rely on. We might be horrified by that, the generations to come will just see it as natural. The third thing is artificial intelligence will have moved a long way, it will permeate every aspect of our lives. It will be like having a very smart personal assistant with you all the time, sorting messages to you, whether they're video communications or written or whatever format, prioritizing your will, helping you make choices, learning your behaviors, say, telling you that you, know, you never forget anything because they're saying, oh, this is used, you met him at a cocktail party three years ago, here's what you need to know about, and here's what you said last time. And then I think we, we know that the internet will just be interwoven into all our lives. It could be controlled, it could be free, we don't know, but it will be interwoven into the fabric of everything we do. So technology will, if we want it to, permeate every aspect of our lives. Okay, that's an interesting um, matter you, you, you raised there because uh, at the end of the day, um, well, kids now go to school, right? Preschool and then, then school, high school, university, uh, and afterwards should be prepared for their, let's say, personal life, right? Uh, you're a father, uh, you just mentioned, I'm a father. Uh, and and, and the, 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 let's say, the future you uh, are, are drawing out there uh, is that uh, learning is uh, continuously, right? But on the other side, uh, you're talking about artificial intelligence and, and what's still the use then of learning for kids. So right? I think learning changes. So there's, there'll, there'll be a valuation. I think society will be very spread. Some will value knowledge for its own sake. I think a lot of what we traditionally go to school for today to be told things, we'll be able to access, we'll be able to download probably directly to our brains. Um, what I think we'll use the school experience for or, or the successor to schools, some people will still have schools that look like they do today other people, it will be a very different experience. It will be a place where we go to learn to socialize, to learn to connect with people, to learn things like empathy, to enhance our limbic energetic connection with people. We'll be doing things like mindfulness meditations. We'll be learning problem solving. We'll be learning cross-cultural competencies. We'll be learning how to work together with each other in different ways. So we'll be learning essential life and learning skills that then help us navigate a lifespan that could last 120, 150 years. Okay, so it's much more oriented at experiences, let's say, in, in terms so. uh, instead of knowledge. It means right? a massive revamp of everything around education, yeah. from delivery to the training of teachers. Okay, uh, that's an interesting um, question because um, uh, education uh, nowadays is, is, is let's say, uh, normally it's responsibility of the, of the government, right? at least in, in, in developed countries. Um, what do you think uh, will, uh, will change in, in that perspective? I think you're going to have a very mixed economy. So in some places the government will still drive the agenda, some places more local levels, whether it's communities or go local government. In some places it will be the parents, uh, who've basically chosen to spend their education vouchers with the school, they'll set the agenda. There'll be competing research institutes offering the best educational models. Mm -hmm. There'll be corporates offering education for free if you buy their products and services. There'll be people saying if you come to our school, our university, our business school, we'll fund your education 
in return for a share of your income for the rest of your life. So you're going to see very different models moving through this. Uh, it won't be a single model of education. It will be more and more diverse across the planet. Which is probably uh, interesting news because uh, well, uh, personally I've, I've been living uh, for years in, in, in Mexico, for example, uh, where uh, college uh, is, is something for rich people, right? So uh, let's say wealth and, and, and richness stays within a, a very uh, limited uh, part of society. Uh, so with these, let's say, trends and technologies, probably wealth could be uh, divided uh, more equally ar around the world. Potentially, and certainly free education via the internet could change a lot of things. So we, we, you know, we know there's the potential for this. There is a risk, obviously, that if you go to a corporate and in return for buying their products, you get education. Mm -hmm. That's just a new form of patronage. It's a, if you go to a venture capital fund and you take their education in return for giving away a share of your income, that's like indentured slavery. You know, this, the, you know, quite often what we're going to see is old models rebranded for the digital era. Uh, right. You know, we don't necessarily see truly open democratic models. A few people are trying to do it, like the Khan Academy, just giving education away for free to anyone. And I think there'll always be a desire and a movement to, to try and encourage that. But the commercial world and commercial instincts will get in the way here. Okay, and, and what's the role of, of government then? Because right now we're also seeing that uh, government basically is, is, is uh, well, much slower than the industry, right? Uh, the Uber model is, is being fought in probably every country I, I know of. Uh, and, and, and governments are, are really slow in adapting to these new models, right? Um, so we, How could governments be more proactive in, in, in that sense? We've reached a turning point. Uh, it might take 20 years to make the transition where models based on you know, everything from you know, first century organization of religion to 17th century early capitalism to early governance models, they were all born prior to the internet and the free flow of ideas and money and people around the planet. So we need some new governance models that take advantage of technology, that are open, act transparent, and I think what we need is experimentation. I think it's fascinating to see how angry the rest of Europe has become with Syriza in Greece. Uh, normally when people get that angry, you know that there's something real. <laughs> you know that it's, they, you know, because if they thought they were just idiots, they would just be ignoring them. But actually there's a very active campaign from European governments to try and undermine what Greece is doing. Because they realize that there could be an alternative model here. And Greece probably you know, has done more thinking about government and how you govern in a changing world than, than any other Western government, maybe Estonia. Does that have to, have to do with the fact that the mathematician, uh, mathematician is, is the leading mathematician there? Mathematician leading it, you know, game theory on, on how you manage the debt and you know, what's the best option for everyone but also just generally their whole approach to thinking through society. And, and you know, how do you move that society on over 5, 10, 20 years? Uh, and I don't think you see that in the rest of Western Europe. And I don't think you see it in many places around the world. It's really kind of deep thinking about how you move a society on, what's the long-term model. There's a lot of rhetoric. There's a lot of belief and hope in the past or whatever. but or kind of blind faith in technology, but actually working through what kind of society you want, what people will be doing in the future, how you ensure a decent standard of living, how you educate, how you protect, you know, the role of money, mm -hmm. civil society, governance, all those things. You need to rethink some of these things. Iceland's doing some experiments, New Zealand's doing some experiments. I think we'll see more and more experiments around the world. We'll have some big messes, but we need some messes to get the breakthroughs. Um, but I think we'll get some very innovative thinking come along in, in the next few years. 50 years from now, we'll have very different governance models. Hell, it could look like Star Trek. But, you know, we, we'll have very different storylines uh, in terms of what, how we govern, how people have a say, how you make big decisions, the extent to which we still have big wars, you know, how we manage resources in society. All of those things we're going to have to deal with in new ways. Okay, uh, you mentioned something, uh, uh, the type of wars, right? Uh, what will the next war be about? So the next wars will be, I mean, for a long time, wars are still going to be about resources, they're going to be about ideology, and they'll be largely conducted ballistically. We'll use weaponry to do it. 
there's all the concerns about fundamentalists, you know, and the way they'll conceive it. I think we may get a point to a point 20 to 30 years time where we may just let the technology resolve disputes for us or we may go to alternative dispute resolution models because it's so expensive the loss in human life the loss and, and the more nuclear we get the kind of contamination issues uh, you know the risk the existential risk that some of these weaponry present is difficult obviously there's a big military industry you know which has a, a, a desire to keep things going so um, I, I think we're going to see very different views. You, you'll see more and more countries say we don't have armies. We, we just can't afford a defence force. Uh, Iceland doesn't have an army today. You know, the, you know, you're going to see different views about how to play out the future and how to conduct conflict. But I think the sheer cost of maintaining a military force, of conducting a ballistic offensive, or a, you know, is going to mean that we'll move to a different model. Interesting. Um, so, so changing the subject, um, business owners. Um, first of all, you mentioned uh, three horizons, right? The, the, the year one operational ex excellence, uh, one to three years for their um, innovation, and the third one, uh, their future. So, what should the horizon be from from uh, business leaders today? I think they've got to make sure that inside their organisation, they've got all three horizons. They need the people who are putting together and delivering the one-year plan. You know, business still works on 12-month cycles and three-month year, three month reporting. Yeah. You've got to be clear on what's going to be different 12 months from now and how you're going to make it happen. And you've got to understand what's changing in the marketplace that could impact that. What are the trends? What are the issues? Secondly, you've got to have the longer-term plans. Where are we going one to three years from now? What's coming that could impact that? What might change the way we do business? What might create new opportunities? What might eliminate current markets for us? How might technology disrupt our thinking? And then four to ten years is really, you know, what are those big changes coming over the horizon? What are those game changes that not just change the rules, but change the game itself? And, and, and who is currently inside the, the organization and, and where's the power? What, what well, do you see? You know, you see now that people have strategy units. Sometimes they look out that far. Quite often it's one to three years. Mm -hmm. I think you have to have different people looking at those three different horizons because they're very different people looking in very different ways. And you need to make sure you never lose sight of the long term, even when you're dealing with the urgent, the urgent stuff. So at the beginning of your meetings, make sure you have a quick update on the three-year plans and what's coming over the horizon four to ten years. And if you need to do anything about them, like look at it in more detail, mm -hmm. you make quick decisions. And then you spend the rest of the meeting dealing with the short term and the urgent. Uh -huh. You know, So you never lose sight of the long term because of urgent issues. And, and is that possible with, uh, let's say, current government's models? I mean, uh, shareholders want direct it should be. It's uh, like, it's, it's, results, right? Everyone makes excuses for not doing it. It's hard, but then that's why we pay people. That's why we have a risk-based economy, because we're paying people to manage our money for the longer term. If they can't do long-term thinking, then we're just taking a risk. And you might as well go and put it on a horse or in a casino because you're taking just as much of a gamble. You know, if your management doesn't understand what's going to shape its environment, it's not talking to its customers about their longer term strategies, it's not scanning for the disruptive developments that could create opportunities or challenges, then they're not doing a good job as leadership and management of the company you're invested in or you're working for. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, let's say uh, take a current set of, uh, of companies and, 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 and CEOs. Um, who is doing, doing well? I mean, who, who are leaders in, let's say, more uh, innovative uh, or, or more future -proofing So right now, the people who are being heralded as future thinking organizations are the ones who are taking a very active role in creating the future. So whether it's startups saying we need different ways of feeding the planet, we're going to stop relying on animals to provide meat, we're going to create synthetic meat so that we can feed at a much cheaper price uh, with much less damage to the planet. At the other end, you've got people like Google, you know, trying to envisage future markets, trying to envisage you know, life expectancy increases, investing in that space, trying to understand how we use information and how they can make it happen. Facebook wanting to become a healthcare provider. You've got all these players, Apple trying to create the technologies that will shape our experiences. So you've got people who are trying to understand, people who are trying to predict, and people who are trying to create. And inevitably, a lot of those are in the science and technology space. Uh, Old world corporations, you know, we see they're struggling. They don't get much airtime anymore. 
The yeah. people who were the titans a few years ago don't. You know, you take G the, the car companies. Ten years ago, collectively, the, the Detroit car companies were worth about 300 billion people dollars. They employed about 750,000. Yeah. Today, Apple, Facebook, Google uh, are worth trillions and collectively they employ less than 200,000 people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very mm -hmm. different model that's emerging yeah. and these new titans behave differently, they have a different relationship with governments, with social systems. They believe they are the new kind of power brokers on the planet. Mm -hmm. The question is how society wants that to play out. Okay, so, so final question. Um, what do I have to do as a CEO or as a, let's say, senior executive uh, within those traditional organizations? What are my three main points I should be doing within the first three so months? So one is have different people in the organization responsible for looking at these different time frames. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're scanning what's coming next as part of that. Secondly, create a scouting team. Create a team whose job it is short-term project to go out and scout what's changing in the world in your industry and others, talk to customers, talk to competitors, talk to suppliers, bring back a picture, create a situation room with that so your staff can see it, put it where you have your lunch, get people seeing what's coming, adding their own ideas. Then start to explore some scenarios for how your world could play out. Use that to identify the opportunities, become a test bed for innovation and then start executing some projects on the back of that. The third is really start to invest in training your senior management and your, your middle level management and all the way through the organization gradually in how to think about tomorrow, how to scan what's coming around the corner, how to make decisions with imperfect information, how to think in terms of scenarios, how to solve complex problems, how to live with uncertainty, with the skills of the future, start investing in those. Okay. Thanks a lot, Rod. Uh, really interesting. Uh, I think we have a lot of uh, stuff to, uh, to discuss still, uh, but, uh, but probably that will be during the day. So uh, thanks for your uh, kind answers. My pleasure. All Thank right. you.